This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. More than enough proof of this is found in the mirrors that are our news and entertainment media. Even as global data show violence of all kinds trending steadily ever downward in the modern era, our appetite to know more about it has increased. I include myself in this. I chose this career after all. Back when I was in medical school in the 1980s, psychiatry was still a specialism that was often overlooked or discounted, despite wide acknowledgement since classical times that a healthy mind was essential to a healthy body. And, as a colleague of mine likes to say, psychiatrists are doctors who look after the only part of the body that votes. As a student, I briefly considered pursuing orthopedic surgery, probably because I wanted to fix things and was attracted by its pragmatic effectiveness. But I was also drawn to psychiatry and its relationship with human identity and communication. I thought it would be profoundly stimulating, both intellectually and emotionally. I saw that the complexity and power of the human mind were immense, and that changing minds had significance, both personally and politically. Over the centuries, humans have often turned to the current technologies for metaphors about the mind. And I guess the most common one we hear these days is that of the mind as a computer, a machine where identity is hardwired. Data about thoughts or emotions are processed and filed. We switch modes when carrying out different functions. Such a model of the mind lends itself to some kinds of research, but has little to say about the complexity of human experience especially in the relational space in which we all live our lives. Physicists like Carlo Rivelli tell us that the universe is relational, therefore so the mind must be, and if that is the case, then we need better metaphors, ones that reflect the organic, ever-evolving nature of psychological experience. I prefer to think of the mind as a coral reef, ancient, layered and mysterious, not without shadows and risk, but containing a nourishing diversity. It might appear chaotic, but it is a complex and structured ecosystem endlessly fascinating and essential to human life. Under environmental stress, many reefs will bleach out and wither, but science has also shown they can be responsive to intervention and made more resilient. As a student, I soon learned that the study of psychiatry would require a deep dive below the surface, into a darkness where things of great beauty as well as danger might appear. It would take time to acclimatize myself and learn to breathe easy. Since then, a long professional voyage has continually inspired in me the awe and wonder that I associate with the ocean and its hidden depths. I love that E. E. Cummings idea that it is always ourselves that we find in the sea. It has been immensely rewarding work and often unpredictable. It has shown me how good and evil, ideas of right and wrong, as well as identities like victim and perpetrator, are not set in stone and can coexist. When I started out, I thought the work I was doing was about making people feel better, but time has taught me that it was about helping them to better know their minds, which is quite another matter. The process is not painless for my patients, and there has been turbulence for me too along the way. I have found that it is inevitable that I will experience some distressing feelings, though they tend towards deep sadness and frustration, more than horror or disgust. It is my job to recognize those responses and hold them with a kind of compassionate detachment, what Buddhists might describe as hovering in the bardo. As my psychiatric training went on, 
I found out about forensic work, which looks at the mind's darker modes that sometimes give rise to risk. The word forensic.